Welcome to Zero Knowledge. I'm your host, Anna Rose. In this podcast, we will be exploring the latest in zero knowledge research and the decentralized web, as well as new paradigms that promise to change the way we interact and transact online. This week, Nico and I chat with Chelsea Comlo. Chelsea is part of the Cryptography Security and Privacy Lab at the University of Waterloo and is chief scientist for the Zcash Foundation. We talk about the spark that got her interested in cryptography research, starting with her work contributing to Tor as an engineer to her move to Zcash as well as her PhD work. We define threshold signature schemes and discuss the optimizations that are possible. And then we dive into her work on the Frost scheme, which utilizes some of these optimizations. We cover how threshold signatures can be used in the wild, the standardization process for Frost, her new work on stateless threshold Schnorr signatures, and more. Now, before we kick off, I wanted to highlight the ZK Jobs Board for you. There you can find jobs from top teams working in ZK. So if you're looking for your next opportunity, be sure to check it out. And if you're a team looking to find great talent, be sure to add your job to the jobs board today. I've added the link in the show notes. Now, Tanya will share a little bit about this week's sponsor. Alio is a new layer one blockchain that achieves the programmability of Ethereum, the privacy of Zcash, and the scalability of a rollup. Driven by a mission for a truly secure internet, Alio has interwoven zero-knowledge proofs into every facet of their stack resulting in a vertically integrated layer one blockchain that's unparalleled in its approach. Alio is ZK by design. Dive into their programming language, Leo, and see what permissionless development looks like, offering boundless opportunities for developers and innovators to build ZK apps. This is an invitation to be part of a transformational ZK journey. Dive deeper and discover more about Alio at alio.org. And now here's our episode. Today, Nico and I are here with Chelsea Comlo. Chelsea is part of the Cryptography Security and Privacy Lab at the University of Waterloo and is chief scientist for the Zcash Foundation. Welcome to the show, Chelsea. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm a big fan, so I'm really happy to be here. Cool. Yeah, we've actually wanted to have you on the show for a long while. Uh, we oh. tried a few <laughs> different routes, and I'm so glad we've made this happen. Um, hey, Nico. Hey, Anna. Hey, Chelsea. Hey. Yeah. Thank you so much for all the work you all do in the community. It's like, it's really fun to see all the shows you all do. And it's just great. Cool. Oh, thanks. I mean, we're really curious to find out more about you too. So like, I think the first question I wanted to understand was like, what was the spark that got you interested in the topics that you work on? Oh, that's fun. <laughs> so actually, yeah. So before going to graduate school, I was an engineer. Okay. Um, which has actually been very helpful in doing cryptography research because I feel like I can put my like prior engineering hat on and think about like, oh, what would we actually want to deploy in practice? Mm. Um, so that's been really helpful when designing research. But yeah, before going to graduate school, I was an engineer and I worked on cryptography and privacy protocols. So I contributed to Tor. I did a little bit of work on Enigmail. I worked on some of the OTR uh, protocol off the record messaging protocol for secure messaging. Yeah, and I just loved it. And then I wanted to be able to design cryptography. So, <laughs> cool. but for threshold signatures, um, that topic really came out of the Zcash Foundation. So in trying to make threshold signatures more usable and easy to deploy, that's where kind of my mm. current work has come from. I want to go even further back though. What got you interested in working on Tor and, and on this type of engineering? Like what drew you to that topic? Well, I guess it's like a little quintessential, but I guess like, I guess it was back in 2013 when all of the big like NSA revelations came out and we heard okay. about how private data was being collected about citizens and it, it made me very passionate and it made me think about what information is exposed online and what do we want to keep private and is mm -hmm. that within our control? And that's really what privacy is about is being able to control what you expose about yourself. And mm. um, that's what got me interested in, well, first contributing to those kinds of tools and then eventually helping design some of them. Cool. What was it like working on tour? What does it mean to do that? Is it sort of just like contributing from afar? Or were you like more in the org? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I, I was a, a core tour contributor. I wrote some Rust that helped 
inspire the use of Rust and Tor, which is Ooh. great because it's a memory safe language. Um, I was on the board for a little while. And overall, I think it's great being a technical person, being able to contribute to projects that people need. So mm -hmm. like people use Tor to circumvent censorship or to look up things privately. And I think it's really great for technical skills to be used for sort of altruistic motivations like that. Did you, after that, then look to study it? Because as, as far as I know, you're doing a PhD now. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, what what was happening maybe at the same time academically? What what led mm -hmm. you to, to the work you're doing today? Yeah, so I was on a team. We contributed to a lot of open source projects like Tor and Enigmail. And then we started doing work on a new version of off-the-record messaging protocol. Mm -hmm. And that's the protocol that Signal eventually built on. Oh, wow. So, mm -hmm, so it basically does ratch things. So you have forward secrecy in your messages. Huh. And in contributing to that, I got to know Ian Goldberg, who's at the University of Waterloo. And I wanted to be someone who could design those protocols myself and write proofs of security and think about not just, you know, implementing what exists, but also thinking about like, how do we design new things? Mm. And that's what inspired me to go get my PhD. And I've been lucky enough to work with Ian Goldberg and Douglas Stebla, who are my co-advisors. And it's, it's an amazing thing to be able to think of ideas and be able to prove them secure. It's very hard. It's non-trivial. <laughs> oh, <yes. laughs> um, and, and like you make tons of mistakes. Like I feel like I've made every mistake in the world at this point, but I'm sure there's more mistakes to make. But it's, it's a fun uh, expertise to have. Nice. Ian Goldberg, I, actually, I should, I should add, um, is one of the OG like cypherpunks. Yeah. Like for those of you who know, like history of where we come from with censorship resistance. Yeah. Ian has a wealth of knowledge about where privacy started and where we are. And he's teaching a new class at the University of Waterloo on just the new generation of privacy enhancing technologies. And there's hmm. so much more we have today, like where private information retrieval is going, um, secure messaging. It's really an exciting space and it's amazing to see people deploying these technologies. That's so cool. It's funny, I, I think in before we kicked off here, I mentioned to you that I think you might be one of the first guests that we have on from University of Waterloo. Oh. Or maybe there were other guests that were from there and I we didn't know that. Mm -hmm. But the university for me it's been famous because, you know, Vitalik went there and there was this mm -hmm. legendary hackathon in twenty seventeen and then another oh. one in twenty nineteen that, you know, spawned a lot of products and ideas that mm. are still used today in our space. Mm -hmm. um, but what is the university like? What is the lab that you're part of like? What, what are the focuses? Yeah, I'm just kind of curious to hear what it's like to go there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a big lab. So I'm in the CRISP lab, the Cryptography Security and Privacy Lab, and people are working on all kinds of things. So like, everything from private machine learning to like more pure cryptography to applied cryptography to um, censorship resistance. So there's a lot of different topics. It's really fun. I actually, so Alfred Menezes uh, teaches at the University of Waterloo and I was sitting in his cryptography class and Vitalik actually came to give a guest lecture. Yeah. So it was kind of a very full circle moment, which is really fun. <laughs> nice. um, there's a lot of post-quantum work going on as well. So cool. um, David Chow, who kind of came up with the uh, SIDH, um, Super Singular Isogeny Diffie Hellman, is faculty there. Um, so there's just a lot of topics. It's a, it's a fun place to be. Very cool. So Chelsea, what has been your focus within the lab? Yes, since 2020, I have done a lot of work on threshold signatures. This was kind of an accident. I started doing work at the Zcash Foundation in 2019. And one of the first questions they asked me is, can we have a more efficient threshold signature scheme? Hmm. So they were looking to use threshold signatures within wallets in the Zcash ecosystem. And at that time, for Schnorr threshold signatures specifically, the most efficient Schnorr threshold signature that existed at that point was one um, by Stinson and Strobel, and it was five rounds. Wow. And when you have basically in a multi-party protocol, 
when I say rounds, what I mean are network rounds. So rounds where parties are communicating to all other parties. So network rounds are very important because parties could go away or you could have network latency or packets could drop. And so multi-party protocols that have fewer rounds are much easier both to implement and overall faster. Mm. So the core question was, can we have a threshold signature with fewer number of rounds than five? And there was kind of a folklore protocol of how to do a scheme in three rounds. But then the question we wanted to ask is, well, can we do even better? Mm. And that's where one of the first projects that I worked on, which is called FROST, and it stands for Flexible Round Optimized Schnorr Threshold Signatures. And uh, we were able to come up with a threshold Schnorr signature scheme that is secure in two rounds. Oh, wow. And what's, what's very nice about Frost is that the first round can be pre-processed as well. So if you especially care about network latency, you can do the first round in kind of a batched manner. And then the you can just have one online round. And that was something people were interested in. So it's kind of taken off since then. And I've done a lot of follow-up on work, work on threshold signatures since then. Cool. I also think an interesting question is why do we care about Schnorr signatures now? Yep. And like, why is there so much work going on in Schnorr signatures? Mm. Yeah. So Schnorr signatures have existed for a long time in terms of like the history of cryptography. They were a very early signature scheme to emerge. And really what a Schnorr signature is, is it's just a proof of knowledge of discrete log, but it's bound to a message. So your secret key is some like field element and your public key is some group element where your secret key is the discrete log of your public key. And so all a Schnorr signature is, is just proving knowledge of your public key, but you additionally bind the signature to some message. And that, that's all a Schnorr signature is. So it's, it's very, very simple. It's existed for a long time, but it's quite amenable to building protocols on top of because it's linear. Mm -hmm. So um, it's quite amenable to building things like uh, multi-party signatures because basically what you can do is you can have all the parties derive a signature share, which itself is a Schnorr-like signature. And then you can just aggregate all of the signature shares and come up with itself, the aggre aggregated signature is itself a Schnorr signature. Oh, cool. So basically the, these um, pieces are very composable mm. and Schnorr signatures lend themselves to sort of more advanced primitives that are easily combinable. Who was Schnorr? Who is this person? Cla Klaus Schnorr is still a cryptographer. Gosh, I, I wish I knew all of the things that he worked on, but... The signature scheme is named after him. Mm. And I think it came out in the 90s, but I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. So, so long time by cryptography. We're talking <laughs> 30 <laughs> years. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> 20, 30 years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. You were talking about aggregating multiple signatures. Are we talking about signatures over different messages, over the same message from different people? Um, what do we mean by aggregation here? Yes. So... I know there's been work done where you can aggregate over different messages, mm -hmm. but when I'm talking about aggregating here, it's over the same message. And so I guess maybe I can take a, a step back. Let me let me take a step back and talk about how a threshold Schnorr signature works. And then I think it'll become obvious of how what aggregation means in the setting. Cool. Sounds great. So the goal for a threshold Schnorr signature is to output a signature that is verifiable under the same algorithm, the same verify algorithm as single party Schnorr. And the reason why that's nice is because if you're an implementation and you already verify Schnorr signatures, then you can also verify threshold signatures without having separate logic. So from an implementation perspective, it's very useful because it just allows for more simplicity and less like logic switching. So yeah, so the goal is to output a plain Schnorr signature, but instead of having one party control a secret key, you have many parties. And so what's nice about that is then you have things like redundancy. So if one party loses their key, you still have other parties that can issue a key. And you also have a distribution of trust. So if you 
say, control a large amount of funds for your customers, your customers might want some kind of they want some kind of assurance that one party can't just disappear with the funds. And so you might want to distribute trust of that secret key. So we want a couple of things. We want unforgeability under all of the secret key shares. We also want unforgeability under the single key that's secret shared among all the parties. And then we want to make sure that when all the parties sign, those what we call signature shares aggregate to a single Schnorr signature. Yeah, so I guess in this case, what we're talking about is one message. There can be variants with additional messages, but hmm. that kind of lends itself to a different protocol and different properties. Why is there work on this now if it already existed for kind of some time before? Yes, that is kind of a spicy question, actually. Mm -hmm. So uh, so short signatures were patented. Oh. And mm -hmm. so a lot of people don't know this. So a lot of people don't understand why we have both ECDSA and Schnorr. And ECDSA is actually like quite painful in the multi-party setting. So you can mm. design very, very simple multi-party Schnorr protocols. And for ECDSA, it's much harder because of the structure of the signature. But what happened is we had Schnorr signatures first, but then a patent was issued and then ECDSA was designed to kind of circumvent that patent. Wow. And so we were left with essentially years of building more complicated protocols <gasps> around uh, a more complicated scheme that circumvented a patent. Whoa. So, yeah, so I think this is a really interesting thing to know and to talk about because I've heard arguments for patents, which say things like, oh, we're investing resources into mm -hmm. cryptography. We should be able to reap the rewards of like those resources, which I think is a compelling argument. But I think history shows us that patents in cryptography lead to decades of mm -hmm. work that we didn't necessarily need to do. And, wow. and actually schemes which are harder to implement and potentially less secure because there could be bugs in implementation. It's also harder to analyze, right? ECDSA yes. from yes. a proving perspective. Yes. So I think as a community, we really need to be conscientious of where we came from and think really hard before diving into patents because, mm. you know, for a certain company, like it might be beneficial, but for the community as a whole, it's very difficult to design around. Yeah. Wow. Which company did the patent? Like, could they have built more stuff? Yeah, I, I'm actually, I haven't looked at the patent myself, so I don't, I don't, I can't go into that much detail. I just sort of know that it okay. was patented and that delayed a lot of, and ECDSA came out around it. And so I guess the important thing though, is that the patent expired. I'm not exactly sure when the patent expired, but that's where, as I understand, we've seen a lot of re-emerging interest in Schnorr signatures cool. and things being built and developed around it. Nice. So there was, there was a delay in research and development. And then when the patent expired, we were able to say like, oh, this is a protocol we can actually deploy now again. And so that's why we've seen a reemergence of, of research in this area. Mm. What's the connection between Schnorr signatures and Bitcoin or Zcash? Like you, you said sort of it came out through your work at Zcash, I'm guessing Bitcoin oriented. Yeah. What's the connection? Yes. So Zcash uses a variant of Schnorr signatures called Red DSA. So it's a re-randomized variant of EDDSA signatures. Again, the, di the difference between EDDSA signatures and Schnorr is extremely minor. EDDSA, you hash in the public key when you're signing the message, but the structure is essentially same, the same. Mm -hmm. So when I'm okay. saying Schnorr, you can sort of also substitute EDDSA. They're extremely similar. So Zcash was already using a, a variant of Schnorr. And then Bitcoin recently with uh, Taproot is starting to move to EDDSA or a variant of EDDSA signatures as well. Okay. 
just to emphasize, EDDSA is not ECDSA. Yeah. And I've seen people yes. make that mistake before. And they look very similar. I kind of made a mistake in our last episode where I yeah. <laughs> used it so, incorrectly. Yeah, it can be confusing, but yes, EDDSA, Schnorr Lake, ECDSA gets around the Schnorr patent. Yeah, don't don't blame the users. The, the names are yeah. very confusing. No, of course. So. Yeah. so I guess this then leads us to the work you did on Frost because... Like, just to, to sort of go back to the purpose of it, you talked about the rounds. Are the rounds like a function of speed or cost? Like, trying to get these rounds down sounds like a good idea, but what are you actually accomplishing when you do that? Yeah, it's speed, essentially. Okay. So anytime you have a multi-party protocol, all the parties start, then they send messages to all the other parties, then they do some processing, then they send messages again. And eventually you have some kind of output. So anytime you send a network message, there's delay. So you have to wait for all the messages to arrive. If not all the messages arrive, you need extra logic. So there's kind of a lot of complexity that go into network rounds. And for things like signing, if you're an exchange and you have to issue like millions of signatures a day, having fewer network rounds is, is quite helpful. Mm. Who are the agents who are actually like getting that speed up though? Is this for the miners? Is this for the like a wallet? Like I'm yeah, I'm kind of curious where this actually gets used. Yes, that is a good question and I think that does play into some of the discussion around do we actually there's been a discussion around do we actually need speed in these signatures. Okay. And um there's been similar discussions I think as well around like do we need speed in zero knowledge proofs? So I think uh, Henry de Valence, who is with Penumbra, said something which I thought was very useful to think about, which is for like a client side application, the most speed you need is enough time for the user to process something, mm. which is kind of slow in terms of like computer speed. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's actually something useful to think about. So yeah, if this is a wallet and it's on a user application, like you can probably tolerate speeds of up to a second. Mm -hmm. But if this is an application, so for example, there's companies that hold shares on behalf of their clients. Mm -hmm. And so the, the agents are servers performing signatures directly, then speed matters because these are just computers talking to other computers. Okay. So the, the agents do they, they differ and the speed requirements differ as those agents differ. Hmm. But then also in terms of like complexity, network rounds can can be important as well because you have things like packets dropping and, and other things like that. It's funny that you mentioned speed and penumbra because in a recent episode that probably came out a few episodes ago, we talked about the same thing with Aline and I made the same shout out to Henry and Penumbra oh. and how their tools <laughs> do everything in the background. So shout out once again. <laughs> yeah, I think it's important for for assumptions. I think it's important to challenge them. So mm -hmm. sometimes I think we get very caught up in speed and sometimes it, it doesn't matter. And I mm -hmm. think that's important to to know and it's context dependent. Absolutely. Other Other things that I think are also important to know is like, on the cryptography side, if you're designing cryptography systems, you want the most security possible in like every dimension. But sometimes those like security trade-offs are acceptable in other dimensions as well, such as like for speed or simplicity. So there's been kind of a tension around, so Frost, for example, is secure under an interactive security assumption and schemes that have more network rounds can be proven secure under weaker assumptions. Hmm. And so there's been a lot of discussion around what assumptions are fine, what do users want, what <laughs> like what is better. And I think the, the important lesson to come out of this is that it depends and it's it's context dependent. Hmm. So is this where the the frost magic happens? Like is this how you reduce all these rounds? Yes. <laughs> so okay. um exactly. So so schemes with more rounds can be proven secure under, for example, discrete log directly, mm -hmm. which is a weaker and kind of well understood common, assumption. Yeah. Yes. So Frost requires an interactive assumption. It's under what we call the algebraic 
one more discrete log assumption. Still, still in the random oracle model. So at least you know mm -hmm. there's that. But it's an interactive assumption, and it basically says, let's say you're given L plus one discrete log challenges and you're allowed L queries for solutions, can you produce L plus one solutions? So basically, can you produce one extra solution than queries that you're allowed? So- Sounds reasonable. I think intuitively it sounds reasonable. This assumption has been out for a while. It's very hard to prove blind signatures secure without this assumption. So this assumption was introduced in the context of blind signatures so again, it's it's context dependent. I think mm. I, I personally feel this assumption is reasonable and especially in a practical setting, it's it's a fine trade-off. But again, it's it's context dependent. One last thing I wanted to ask. When we start a threshold signature, do the signers have their private key that they generated on their own, or do they have to somehow have shares of a key? Like where do we start from? Yes, the bootstrapping question is a very important question to ask. <laughs> um, yeah, so so signers have to bootstrap with a secret shared key. It's Shamir secret shared. So basically, every party has a point. Their share is essentially a point on a polynomial, and the secret key, this joint secret key, is the constant term of that polynomial. Mm -hmm. And when you combine signature shares, what you're doing implicitly is polynomial interpolation to some other point on the polynomial, which is unknown. So really the magic, it's very simple, is given t plus one points on, on a polynomial, you can find any other point on the polynomial. So that, that's all that's happening under the hood. And so we, we bootstrap by using either just plain Shamir secret sharing using a trusted dealer, or another um, multi-party protocol, which is what we call a distributed key generation scheme. And so what that is, is again, you have all the parties, they're all participating, and the output from that protocol is secret key shares that every party holds that combine to some secret key that no party knows, but all parties have contributed to. So it's kind of like a magic black box. Every party throws in some randomness. And at the end, they all get secret key shares that combine to a secret key that no one has actually seen. Mm. So the thing I'm still not entirely clear on is almost like in a system like Zcash, do you implement this somewhere or is it on an app? Like, is it on a wallet level? Like, I understand the research being created, but I don't really know where it fits in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the Zcash Foundation has implemented Frost and also a DKG and trusted dealer keygen, and then applications can pull it in okay. as they need to. So Got if you're it. a Zcash wallet, you will pull this into your application. And the team right now is doing some work to make pulling that in a little easier. So they're working on demos and other things like that. But this is kind of like a core library, and then it's pulled into various applications. Nice. It's, and this is why it's being used outside of Zcash as well, because it's essentially protocol agnostic. So you can you can pull it into mm -hmm. to like other wallets that maybe need to implement more signatures. And like you said, usually the applications will be either creating redundancy, so making sure that if you lose one of your key shares, you have more and someone yes. stores them for you. Yes. So account recovery or uh, multi-sigs, like distributing trust, mm. having multiple people having to sign. Yes. So something that's very important to know, so we didn't write this in the Frost paper originally, but there's tricks for doing share recovery. So if one party loses its share, there's established protocols out there for rederiving that share or creating new shares so that that party can recover their signing key. And there's also protocols for generating new shares for new parties. So if you're out there and you have questions about like, okay, do I have just a set number of shares or is this dynamic? The answer is yes, it's dynamic and protocols exist for that. Hmm. And you've, you've mentioned sort of multiple parties throughout this, but we haven't actually said like multi-party computation, does it fall <laughs> under that category or are we working like beside, are they just similar? <laughs> yes. Um, so it is, yes. So technically threshold signatures are, is a special form of multi-party computation. I think it's nice to distinguish because 
when you say a multi-party computation, this can be done generically. Mm. So you can essentially take any function and distribute it among parties. Mm. And there's generic tools for doing this. Those generic tools could also be used to do threshold signatures, but they're generally less efficient. Okay. And so, and this is common in like other kinds of cryptography where you can design generic tools, but they're less efficient, or you can design, you know, schemes that are for specific use cases, and then you can tailor them for that specific use case, and they tend to be more efficient. Cool. So I think it's kind of nice to distinguish. Hopefully one day we'll have generic MPC that can just MPC everything. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and people like, I think, especially in the FHE world are, are moving in that direction, which is very exciting. Uh, um, cool. But right now we, we have the very simple threshold signature case, which is quite tailored. So got it. I'm glad I got to work that question in because yeah, just a shout out to Nigel Smart, who, who did f finally introduce us. He was the one who finally yes. made the connection and he had recommended <laughs> he, we've done an episode in the past or actually two episodes on MPC, but a pretty recent one. Um, so I can, all, we can also link to that. Yes, absolutely. And yeah, I, I am really excited for what places like Zama are doing and mm -hmm. having, yeah, having generic MPC and like FHE is a really strong tool. And I think it will be, it, it's really exciting to see where it'll go in the future. So cool. hopefully we can have FHE for everything and, you know, all of our problems will be solved. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> <laughs> Although what it looks more and more like is it sees like combos, like ZK yes. and FHE. And mm -hmm. some, anyway. So back to Frost, you said Frost was developed coming from the use case that Zcash needed. Is this kind of a standard technique? Is this, I guess, being standardized for other people to use? Yes. So we wrote an informational draft for the CFRG, the Cryptography Forum Research Group within the IETF. The reason why we did it actually was because we put out Frost and then I had a lot of people emailing me to say that they were implementing Frost, but they were implementing it in slightly different ways and making Ooh. slightly different choices around things like serialization of data. Mm. Um, Hash functions. Just, yeah, like slight variations that I knew down the line would potentially be confusing and then potentially having bugs as well. Yeah. So Was I, that so very stressful to you? <laughs> well, seeing the work being taken apart like that. <laughs> I mean, it was exciting, but also I, I was worried that, well, one, we would have like a lot of incompatibilities. Mm -hmm. And I actually had um, auditors tell me that they had seen bugs pop up. Mm -hmm. So for example, someone told me that they saw an implementation of Frost where the nonces were being derived deterministically as they're done in EDDSA. So instead of sampling nonces at random, the nonces were generated by hashing the secret key in the message. So if you're used to single party EDDSA, this is what you do. You mm. hash the message um, and the secret key to generate your nonce, which is private. So that's totally reasonable. But in the Frost setting, this leads to a secret key recovery attack and two signing sessions. Whoa. So it's like a total break if you if you do this. Is this the insecurity of ROS paper? No. So Different. ROS okay. Yeah, ROS comes down to how the scheme is actually designed. And so Frost was one of the first schemes that was secure against ROS. Okay. Um. And it's because of how Frost essentially has two nonces. You hash in like the transcript from the first round, and then that mm -hmm. becomes your overall nonce and that avoids ROS attacks. But the the key recovery attack, if you derive your nonces deterministically, is just because the, the adversary has input into the challenge. Mm -hmm. So essentially, as long as the adversary changes, doesn't follow the protocol deterministically, but the honest player does, there's a trivial key recovery attack <laughs> oops, <big> oops. <laughs> um, that's, yeah. that you can't detect. Um, okay. So someone told me this and I was like, oh no, it would be great if we actually had something because a research paper isn't written with like exact engineering details. Mm. Um, it's basically enough to show what's going on so that you can prove the scheme secure, but it's not enough details for engineers to follow to make really important decisions like serialization or ordering or other like details that are 
somewhat important. So, so yes, that's why we decided to write this informational draft, basically, mm -hmm. because people were implementing it and we wanted something that was more useful. So that, that process is wrapping up right now. And conveniently, NIST has also put out a call, or they're very soon to putting out a final call for threshold schemes as well. Cool. And we'll be basically taking what we submitted to CFRG and turning that into a into a NIST submission. But then with NIST, does NIST need to choose that? And then it becomes sort of the standard, but you're kind of up against other types of... So this threshold call is different than what NIST did for the post-quantum call. Okay. So for single party signatures, it's I think it's easier to have a kind of uniform competition because you can do things like define what the API is, uh, define what the inputs and outputs are. And this is what was done for the NIST post-quantum uh, competition. For threshold signatures, it's a little harder because there's so much variation within the actual schemes itself. So even though for thresholdized EDDSA, they all might be putting out a single party EDDSA signature, the internals of the scheme are all quite different. I think right now NIST is trying to decide what they'll do, but this call is basically uh, send us your schemes in more detail than in the paper and and then the and is still being decided, as I understand. <laughs> <That's fair. laughs> Got it. So, um, so yeah. So Luis, um, who's at NIST, who's sort of organizing all of this, would be a great person to have on the show. So mm. he has more context and a plan and vision for where this will go. So hopefully you can have him on and ask him these questions. Maybe we could do an app on standardization generally. Yeah. We've never yes. talked to anyone from NIST. Yes, he would be a great person to have insight into what they're trying to do. So... We now have, or soon to be, a frost standard. What comes next? What's the rest of Chelsea Comla's work? <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully, I'm just getting started. So um, <laughs> I have grand, you know, grand plans for the future. But um, I guess one thing that this process has taught me, and I kind of referred to this before, which is there's different trade-offs in deploying cryptography for practice into practice. Mm -hmm. So the trade-offs I sort of think about are things like usability, security assumptions, and then performance. So those are kind of the, the different axes when you're designing a scheme and you have different trade-offs along, along those different axes. Mm -hmm. So before I talked about how people were using Frost deterministically and it was trivially broken, <laughs> um, yep. I've been thinking about how to do deterministic Frost for a long time and it's a very hard problem. It's extremely difficult to do it in a way that's secure. There's been work done to do deterministic threshold Schnorr signatures. And basically those works require things like generic SNARKs or generic MPC. Mm. So you can do deterministic threshold Schnorr but it requires some kind of heavyweight tools. Mm -hmm. I guess, so even taking a step back, when I say deterministic threshold schnorr, the reason why this is something we want is not only because you can not have to rely on fresh sources of randomness when you're generating your signature, but also because signers can be stateless. So basically you perform a round and you don't have to save any state. And then you perform your next round and you can just rederive all of the state. So from an implementation perspective, this is great because you don't have to cache things in a database, mm -hmm. take a lock on the database, look up the thing in the database, carefully delete information yeah. that if you don't delete it, your secret key is leaked, unlock the database. <laughs> um, so, so we really want, like these schemes are actually quite attractive, I think in practice, but currently they require heavyweight tools. Yeah, so I have some upcoming work, which I think I'm I'm interested to see what practitioners think about it. Hmm. So basically, the work is called Arctic, which I'm I think is nice. Arctic, yeah. <laughs> Thematic, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so not, yes. Is it also so, an acronym? It's not. I, oh. I couldn't I couldn't think of an acronym with like DTS came into like a nice word. Um, I spent a lot of time thinking about it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but Ar Arctic was the best I could go. How much compared to the time thinking about the paper? 
I mean, not as much, but like, <laughs> <laughs> there, I, I did, I did try hard to make an acronym and just, just failed. Um, I'm always on the market for like good scheme names. So mm. okay. please tell me your good scheme names in the future if you have them. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of variation on cold things that could fit into all of this. Yes. So I'm, <laughs> I'm on the market for it in the future. Um, nice. <laughs> Yeah, so basically Arctic is a deterministic threshold Schnorr signature, and it's very simple. It doesn't require generic MPC or um, things like generic zero-knowledge proofs. But the trade-off that it makes is that it requires a larger number of assumed-to-be honest signers. Hmm. So basically for Frost, the security model <clears throat> that it's secure under is you can have T signers, and up to T minus one of them are assumed to be honest. So one honest party would be enough. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, and that's like a very nice security model that you can, yeah. you can reason about. So you have one honest party. Um, for Arctic, Arctic assumes total two T minus one parties where T minus one of them is assumed to be dishonest. Mm -hmm. So, Really, what we require is out of your total set of signers, the majority of them are honest. Right. Mm. So we go from single honest party to majority honest. Yes. Okay. But exactly. could it really just be like 51% honest, kind of? Just yes. a little bit? Yes. Just a little <laughs> bit more honest. Okay. You're, it's not exactly. a 66% situation. No, it's, okay. it's like 51% honest. And, and so it's interesting because we do have assumptions like that already in cryptocurrencies. So for mm. things like consensus. So in other places, we have like 51% honest as an assumption. But so far in, in threshold signatures, we haven't really explored those kind of assumptions. And so with Arctic, basically, we, we say, okay, if you're fine with those kind of assumptions, you can have a stateless scheme. Um, that's pretty simple. So then again, it's up to implementers to say, what trade-offs am I fine with? Am I fine with deploying more signers and then having a simpler scheme that has like these nice security properties? Or do I really need that like all but one honest? About your your last axis, speed, how, how does Arctic perform in terms of speed? It's pretty fast. <laughs> okay. Is it still um, two rounds or is it a bit more? It, it's two rounds. So I guess, okay, so there, there's a trade-off. So for groups under like size 25, it's pretty fast. Um, there's a, a trade-off. And like for larger groups, music DN, which requires generic uh, zero knowledge proofs, music DN is faster. So there, there's a crossover point. But what we see is like, okay, for smaller sized groups where you're fine with 51% honest, you can have a, a faster scheme. Mm. But again, I, th I think it's interesting putting out these axes more explicitly and then thinking about like, what are we fine with? But at least we have like all of the options and, you know, applications can say, I don't know, we don't mind implementing bulletproofs and like, we're fine with something being slower. Mm. Music, music DN is fine. Or simplicity of the implementation is important to us because we're scared about bugs mm -hmm. and we want something to be fast for smaller groups, then something like Arctic is a better choice. You've sort of said, like, I've, I've heard more about deterministic, but also stateless. How, like, are those the same thing? Are those connected? Yes. So determinism is the means to statelessness in this okay. thing. So we have a deterministic scheme. Or you might read about deterministic threshold Schnorr schemes. But when we say deterministic, that means that the scheme is also stateless. Because basically, given an input, I can derive some state. And you know what it is. In some round. Mm -hmm, and you know what it is. And then so in the next round. you have to save state yes, exactly. somewhere else. Okay. Exactly. So if you're given the same um, inputs to these different rounds then you can deterministically derive that output. Cool. So, but they, they are like kind of thrown around interchangeably. So it's a good, it's a good question. <laughs> when is this work coming out? Um, as soon as I put the paper up on ePrint. 
Okay. Which is hopefully this week. <laughs> oh, cool. Oh, so if it's out, we can link it in the show notes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, by the time yes. this comes out, we should have it. Yes, oh. that would be great. Um, yeah, I really am curious. This was kind of a hunch that I thought something like this would be interesting to implementers. So I'm, I'm very curious to hear feedback or thoughts from from people working in practice. So like as people see it and think about it, if they have questions, I would love to talk to people about it. Cool. Um, in this, you talk about this concept of dishonest, but I don't think we've really talked about what that would mean to be dishonest in this particular case. I mean, we know what dishonesty is for validators sometimes. We know, but yeah, yeah. What, what is dishonest here? Yeah, that's a good, yeah, it's a good question because we also throw that term around a lot. Um, it generally just means someone who you have no assumptions about how they will interact with the protocol. So they could follow the protocol honestly, they could appear to th follow the protocol honestly, but like store extra stuff, mm. um, you know, generally with some like nefarious goal in mind, like recovering the secret key or outputting a forgery or, mm -hmm. you know, performing denial of service attacks. But technically when we use that word, it just means a party for which you have no guarantee how they will act within the protocol. Where would, would these agents act dishonestly? Is it like in the rounds before, after? Yeah. So it could, it could be any time. So I'm an adversary. I have corrupted, let's say, two participants, and I know their secret keys. I could initiate signing rounds with honest parties and follow the protocol exactly. And then I could take everyone's information and then I could try to do something nefarious with it. Afterwards. Okay. Afterwards. I could take my secret keys and do something to them, like flip the bits or something. Mm. And then I could participate in the signing protocol, honestly, take the stuff that I received and try to do something nefarious with it. So it's really, it's very tricky. And I think um, writing proofs for these types of schemes is quite hard because there's a lot of nuance in what a corrupted party could potentially do. So it's anything from before it starts, while the protocol is going on, or even afterwards. And when we say honest majority, do we mean these actors act honest throughout the protocol? Or do we say at each round, a majority of people have to be honest? Yeah, so when I say like honest majority, what I mean is that there are T participants who follow the protocol as described throughout okay yes throughout the protocol mm -hmm. so practically what this means is there's t machines whose secret keys have not leaked mm -hmm. like th this is practically how it how it translates but like when you're writing the proof this is kind of what you meet when you do the modeling are there any schemes that consider the case where the set of honest parties changes between rounds Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So there's schemes that consider adaptive security, mm -hmm. and this is exactly what you're talking about. So static and adaptive is, I would say, kind of a more theoretical term with like a, a practical lens. So when we write proofs, something that's very easy when writing the proof is saying, let's say you have N parties, and at the beginning of the proof, I say parties one through five are corrupt, and they're those are the dishonest ones and the honest ones are like, you know, the last party and like the world stays the same throughout the proof. Mm -hmm. But that's not actually what happens in practice. Like what happens in practice is like you can have an adversary that corrupts one machine and then it determines like on the fly who it wants to corrupt afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, and this is essentially adaptive uh, security where throughout the protocol, the adversary can choose who it corrupts. Um, from a proof writing perspective, this is much harder to model. Mm -hmm. Sounds like so. <laughs> um, so I do think there's, you know, benefits for for writing proofs statically, but the adaptive model is closer to what we see in practice. Wow. So do you have a an adaptive frost variant? Um, I think we can prove frost adaptively secure itself. So direct frost. Um, the proof is very hard. Okay. It's very. We're working on it. It is a work. It is currently being worked on, but it is non-trivial. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's an interesting research question around what theoretical trade-offs do you have when you assume adaptive security. So again, like if we have 
simpler schemes, which are statically secure, is that better? I think that's an interesting question to, to think about. And like, if you're assuming adaptive security in the proofs, but you have a less efficient scheme, what, like, what does that mean? Mm. And, I, you know, that's kind of an interesting conversation for all of us to have. Cool. So I, I want to ask a question about not this new work, but the work we were just talking about before Frost, before we sign off, which is on potential use cases. Like we sort of mentioned, you know, security of these systems and that people had actually implemented them. I'm curious if you could just share any of those implementations. Yeah. So the thing I love about Frost is it's kind of evolved into its own thing and people are doing lots of stuff about it. And then I learned about it on Twitter, which is like... <laughs> The best thing, in my opinion. It's so cool. <laughs> um, so one project that's seemed exciting is um, Frost Snap. So the name is really fun. And it seems like they're implementing Frost like for the Bitcoin ecosystem in hardware. Oh, cool. Again, I think it's amazing because like I actually don't know them. I just watched their work on Twitter and I think it's, it's great. I, so. I think I've seen these. It was a picture of like little things that plug into a phone and they can plug into each other as well. Oh, cool. And then together generate a, a signature. Oh, cool. Yeah, they'd be fun to have on the show. So yeah. I would I would love to hear how they're actually doing it. Are there ever cases of these kinds of signature schemes being used together with ZKPs? And I'll give you just a bit of context to this question. Like we have seen a lot of crossovers with general MPC and ZKPs or FHE and ZKPs. So I'm just curious if like, can something like Frost be used with ZK? I mean, obviously it's used in Zcash, so there's some connection, but I don't, is it really kind of being used together with ZKPs? Yeah. So I think this is an interesting question and something that's still being explored. So in the Zcash setting, it's interesting because Frost is used at the signing level. So signers um, sign a transaction, but then the prover can be a separate entity mm -hmm. that isn't trusted to hold the secret signing key. So you can have a setting where you have many signers and one prover. Oh, okay. And that's, I think, a very nice architectural and system design in that these um, roles are separate so that you can set it, separate out the signing key from the, the prover functionality. Mm. So, so that's what, what Zcash is doing. There has been work into like multi-party zero knowledge proof generation. So there's um, some work and we can link it in the show notes, but there's some work where you take your witness, your secret witness and you secret share it among provers and then the provers generate the proof in a distributed manner and then they send it back to you and then you mm -hmm. combine it. Uh, that, that's interesting, I think. Um, the downside of that work is you have to outsource your witness to other parties. Okay. And like, maybe that's fine, but like, maybe sometimes that's not fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that, that just means there's no privacy, right? Or like, or there's only privacy between you and this other party. Yes. Um, so the witnesses secret shared, so they don't learn it, but they do learn like what you're proving. So. Okay. I think there's also been some recent work using FHE again, which is like the magic thing mm -hmm. that hopefully will solve everything where <laughs> um where you can have like an untrusted server doing fhe to generate your proof without ever actually seeing your witness in the clear so i think that some of that work has been done um by sanjam garg at the university of berkeley there's been like many implementations of frost and i won't list all of them here but in the cfrg GitHub repository for Frost, we list out different implementations and the organizations that have implemented it. Hopefully we can include those in the show notes so people can go and look at other works that are using Frost as well. Cool. We'll add for sure. Kind of bringing it back to your earlier experience and sort of the, the thing that first got you excited about the general space, working in privacy. Um, I'm just curious what your feelings are about the space today and the research that's being done and sort of how it's being implemented? So I think it is a thing people care about and it is a thing people are designing products around. So that's a great place to be. I do think sometimes some privacy research goes a little into the like, how do we collect data, mm. but in a way that's private or how do we like allow tracking, but in like a more private way. 
And I think practically that research can be useful if it means like it gets us to a better place than collecting everything and storing it. Mm -hmm. But I think as a community, you know, it, it, it always comes back to like the ethical implications of your research. And I think we always have to think about what are we designing and beyond it being like a cool and hard research problem, which like, I love those myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love the challenge. Like we all do, but like, what are the ecosystem implications for the work that we do? Mm. And there's always the practical, like, well, you know, in the ad tracking business, people track everything now anyway. So let's do something that's a Make little better. better. Yeah. yeah. So I don't think there's a right answer, but I think as you know, there's the, the moral obligation of the work that we do. And we always have to ask the question about what is making something better versus what is legitimizing tracking mm. and what organizations do we support and what goals are they trying to achieve? Again, I think that's why like FHE and like the work that's being done to make that practical is like an amazing feat. Um, mm. That's really exciting. And in the meantime, like there are always trade-offs and like every organization makes trade-offs. So like, for example, Tor makes security and privacy trade-offs to make the tool fast. Mm. So like every, every organization has trade-offs and you can't get around it, but as long as we're talking about what those trade-offs are and who it benefits, mm. I think that that's the thing we really have to sort of think about. I have a variation on this. I was just thinking about this has come up, you know, for many months, many years, the the idea of ZK being used not for privacy, mm. but for other <laughs> things. And um, I've sort of argued that, well, ZK is useful. ZK is a, a useful short form for like all sorts of different cryptography, also snarks that aren't, in, you know, using the zero knowledge property. Mm -hmm. But actually, just recently, someone joined our Telegram group kind of shocked <laughs> that all of these companies that do roll-ups with ZK at the front of their names yeah. are not private at all. And um, <laughs> I was I was a bit like, oh, no, like that's like a messed up narrative there. A bit of a missed, it's a miscommunication. And uh, that actually worries me a little bit because I think then people think they're operating in a private space when they're not. And that could lead to potential problems. I think, though, there's a big... So when I first started doing cryptography research, I was like, I will never work on something that is not practical. I was like, I've been an engineer. I've seen all the papers that like you can't implement. I will never do a thing that can't be implemented. <laughs> um, but, but I actually How did that think, go? <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah, it's, it's actually very hard to do things that are ready for use and practical mm -hmm. immediately. So I think the stance of viewing things as a progression is great. And even though like, yeah, maybe ZK isn't being used right now, the work that's being done to make it fast means that tomorrow we could have a private driver's license on our phone. Mm -hmm. Like that is a reality True. that I think is coming to fruition. And the work that's being done to standardize ZK means that companies who like want standards and like maybe to use ZK in another, in another context could do that. Mm -hmm. So I don't actually think anything is wasted and mm -hmm. the progress that's being made is amazing. And I think where I sit now after being in the space and in, in research for a while is it's very hard to tell when something might be useful and actually mm -hmm. like you throw something out in the wild and like you don't know. And then maybe 10 years down the line, someone finds another use case or builds on it or finds a tweak that actually makes it useful in practice. Um, yeah. So I, I do think we will see like ZK for things like private identity in the future. Mm -hmm. And for sure, especially like, I do want to give a shout out to the people who are doing um, standards work in ZK. Like that's a very complicated thing to do. Um, writing standards is very hard and it's kind of like an uncelebrated job even harder when the schemes keep changing. Yes, as so is the case fast. With ZK. Yeah, yeah, the field is moving really fast, and like the schemes are complicated. But like the people who are doing that are doing like heroes' work because I think mm -hmm. in the future it will unlock a lot of use cases for zk. Cool, Chelsea. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Yes, thanks so much for having me. This is such a pleasure, and thanks for all the work you all do. 
I'm glad we were able to to organize it this time around. We're really excited to see the new work Mm -hmm. and yeah, hope to have you back on with your next endeavor. I would love that. (laughs) Cool. Thank you so much. (laughs) All right. Thanks, Nico. Thanks both. And thanks, Chelsea, for sharing some of the new work. I want to say thank you to the podcast team, Rachel, Henrik, and Tanya, and to our listeners. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.